Hi, my name is Anita. It's so great to meet you. So, um, what do you do? It's the ultimate icebreaker question, isn't it? It's how we get to know each other, how we put each other into boxes and put labels on those boxes. Oh, you're an architect. Neat. Taxi driver, huh? Cool. An accountant. Awesome. Our identities are synonymous with our jobs. And see, that's problematic because not everyone can work. Some people are in between jobs and some people simply don't like their job enough to think, think that that is their most identifying feature. And there is one other problem with that, and that is that the landscape of our jobs is about to change radically thanks to new technology. Personally, when I get the question about what I do for work, I usually go, well, it's a little complicated. I'm really passionate, though, about building technology that make people's lives better. Right now, I'm building an artificial intelligence for science, and I have been blessed to learn from some of the best technologists and futurists in the world. You see, the future is absolutely crazy. We're already living in a science fiction novel. We are living at a time of unprecedented technological growth. And if you think the, tran the transition until what is today like a 600 bucks, 600 US dollars device that fits in our pocket, knowing that about 20 years ago, that cost $10 million and would take up this entire space on the stage. If you think that that is a pretty neat transition, then you have seen nothing yet. What we're gonna see over the next few decades is going to be entirely mind-blowing. And we're talking 3D manufacturing, we're talking nanotechnology, biotechnology, robotics, artificial intelligence, genomic, rewriting genes, personalized medicine. To quote Salim Ismail, we are having about a dozen Gutenberg moments, all at the same time. And let's take artificial intelligence as just one of these examples. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with AI, uh, the basic principle is to um, build a computer less like, say, a calculator and more like a human brain. Computers that we have today are really good at calculating large numbers, for example, right? But they're not so good at recognizing that a cat is a cat, which is something you know, a three-year-old human can do. But by building computers more like humans, they can solve a lot more complex problems. And the thing to realize about artificial intelligence is that this is not a new field, even though there's sort of a hype going on right now. As a research field, it's been around since, you know, since the early 50s, in science fiction even longer than that. But it is only the last, say, five years, the kind of mere mortals, such as, such as ourselves, uh, that don't have access to a supercomputer at a university, that don't have access to uh, massive amounts of data, you know, the last five years we actually have. Which means the applications we're seeing right now, so kind of real life applied artificial intelligence, we've only seen the tiny, tiny, tiny little beginning. And artificial intelligence is already better at humans, at things like playing chess, playing uh, Jeopardy, playing Go, diagnosing cancer in x-ray uh, images of lungs, and actually, in fact, today, recognizing that a cat is a cat. A computer can do that better than a human, an AI computer. Artificial intelligence will change the landscape of our jobs, for example, in things like customer service, in things like data administration, in things like accounting. And again, artificial intelligence is just one of this dozens of different fields that all in and of itself will change the world as we know it. And that will also change the landscape of our jobs, of course. Vivek Vadva, he has proposed that the, this change and or you know, loss of jobs will come in three succinct waves. The first one is transportation. And this is something we're already seeing today, right? Taxi drivers being replaced by Uber drivers. Uber in 2016 are running their first experiments with autonomous vehicles, which means within few years, all Uber drivers will be replaced by no drivers, right? Finland is running their first autonomous buses in 2017. The next model of Tesla will come with a make money for me button, right? So we're seeing this happen already. Same goes for long haul transportation, mail delivery services, they will all be replaced by autonomous vehicles. Now the next uh, wave of job loss and or change is gonna be manufacturing. Uh, we're already seeing this, there was a Chinese factory recently that laid off 60,000 workers on the spot, replacing them with robots. But it's not just factories, it's also farmers, 
fast food chefs, baristas, um, even bartenders. Here we can have robots doing those jobs a lot more efficiently and precise. The third wave, and here's where it starts getting really scary for some of you, is analysts. We're talking lawyers, doctors, journalists, right? We're still gonna need some human level on it, but a majority of the grunt work will be done by AI and other technologies, right? And the interesting thing, when we talk about this job loss and change, one of the main questions that usually pop up, as opposed to what you would think, it's not, well, how am I gonna make money, right? We assume that we'll manage that part. The question that usually pops up is, but I love my job. Like, my, my job is what gives my life meaning. What would I be doing without it? And, and I get that, um, but someone who's actually never had kind of a, a, a real job, full-time employment, I might be able to offer a little bit of perspective because I've given this a lot of thought in, in my own kind of career, if we want to call it that. Um, you see, when I think about this real job concept, um, I think of this, you know, I have to be at a certain place at a certain time, which means I need to be in traffic with everyone else. There's exhaust, there's stupid drivers, I get to the office, I see the same faces of the same people, those I love, awesome, those I don't really like, fine, but I, I can't really choose myself, and I have to do the same repetitive tasks over and over, and I, I know that that's probably how, you know, your jobs are mostly not, but isn't there kind of a core of truth to it in any case? Besides, don't we all feel like we want to um, spend more time with our kids, more times with our parents, more time with friends, we want to learn to play guitar, we want to hike more, be out in nature more. You know, we all have these things that next year, next year I'm going to do this, I'm going to have more time for that. And I've come to this realization, and, and you can agree with me or you can disagree with me, but it's kind of a basic principle like, I don't think that a nine to five job is the ultimate human experience. And the cool thing about this kind of revolutionizing technological you know, phase that we're in right now is that we get to rewrite the social construct of work because that is what it is. It is a social construct. It is no more than 200 years old and it's brought forth by the Industrial Revolution. So I dabble mainly um, in the future, but I happen to be practically married um, to someone who dabbles mainly in the past, an archeologist. And um, I wanted to, you know, together, let's go back in the past a little bit to look at this social construct of work. You see, if we go, say 10,000 plus years back to the hunters and the gatherer societies, right? Now I had this picture from when I was in school, I had this picture of hunters and gatherers as this, you know, malnourished, hardly clothed person like scraping their way across barren ground and they find this little bush of blueberries and they, they eat that and, and that's their only meal of the day, but I mean, that's just not how it was at all. So one estimate is that the hunters and gatherers spend about six weeks per year on the hunting and the gathering. And the rest of the time, I don't know, they would hang out with friends, tell stories by the bonfire, make art, have sex. I mean, it doesn't sound like such a bad life, does it? But it is a long time ago. Let's move forward a little bit, right? To the ancient, uh, ancient Greeks and the polis of Athens. Now, before we go get into there, you know, I want to make absolutely sure I do not condone slavery, and I do not condone separating the female half of the population outside of citizenship. But with that said, let's look at the, the citizens of the polis of Athens. Your job as a member of society was to be an active part, an active participator in democracy. And that was the key to your identity. If you were of the poorer citizens of Athens and you could not afford going to the theater, you would get support from the polis to go to the theater because that was where art and culture and society and politics met. And that was key to your identity to participate in that. Plus, speaking of social constructs, um, men today are so worried about being perceived as gay but back in the old Greek times, everyone was a little gay. I mean, that was just how it was, right? Talk about social construct. We'll move forward again. A couple of hundred years ago, the Industrial Revolution is in full bloom. And with that came ma major factories, 
and with that, workers, right? And then the workers' rights movement is born. And we have, you know, a limitation of work hours, six-day work weeks, five-day work week, eight-hour work days, no child labor, you know, unions, all really, really good things to make sure that human beings were not exploited. But here is the point that as we move forward into a post-industrial society, we have to change that system because that system is not going to cut it anymore as we have skilled labor whose skills are no longer needed and who takes time to re-educate them, right? So we need a new system. Personally, I'm a big fan of basic income, making sure that every human being on this planet is taken care of and have their basic needs met. And I believe that basic income will be the system we need until the robots that are producing everything for us actually become sentient uh, and start their own unions and their own workers' right movements, and then we're, we're, we're back to, to square one. Um, and actually, it's not a joke, I actually believe that, but fair enough. Um, which is another question that usually comes up in these discussions, which is, you know, Will we have this us and them? You know, will there be this final battle for, you know, for the human race? Humans versus robots and you know, everyone who's seen Terminator or those kinds of films, right? Here's the point. So first of all, yes, when we build artificial intelligence, we need to be mindful so that we don't build it in a way that they sooner or later might harm humans. And we can do that and there's lots of great people doing that. However, a more important point, let's say it would take 25 years for robots to become sentient. By that time, it will not be clear what is human and what is a robot. Robots might become more biological, but also human, humans will be augmented by technology. You know, for those of you who have one of these, right, this is my external hard drive. This is part of my brain now. I put who I'm supposed to call, how I'm supposed to get a hold of them, what I'm doing when. I took that out of my own brain and I put it into my external brain, right? And I think you all do that. We're already cyborgs. Personally, I took it a small step further. I actually have a tiny little chip implanted in my hand in the shape of an RFID tag, the size of a rice grain. I can open doors to it, you know, I, with it. I can uh, have my gym membership card uh, coded in it, etc. And I promise you that a decade from now, things like that will be completely normal. We are becoming cyborgs. But let's take it back to the present, shall we? Those of you who have a kid or know a kid, has probably asked that kid, so what are you gonna be when you grow up, right? Or maybe the kid has asked you, what should I study to have a safe future? What do you tell that kid, right? We know that 60% of grad school students are studying towards careers that will be obsolete by the time that they graduate, right? So what do you tell them? The thing is that we are teaching our kids the wrong things. Because the school system that we are in today is from an industrial revolution era, right? We're not teaching them the right things. We need to teach them critical thinking, source criticism, creativity, complex problem solving. We need to teach them to think for themselves and follow their passions. And we're not doing that today. Ray Kurzweil, famous futurist and one of my teachers, he says the following about the future of work. He says that in the future, when we work less, it's not that we're just gonna sit around and do nothing. We're gonna do the things that we like. We're gonna follow our passion. Now, why don't we just call that work? So it is my hope that when I, when I meet one of you, say 10 years from now, you're not gonna ask me what I do, but you're gonna ask me, so what's the most interesting thing you did last year? Or, what are you learning right now? Or maybe something as simple as, what are you passionate about? Thank you.